last Christmas, as things were starting to open up, there was a typhoon that hit. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Scott Trevithan, who is the CEO and founder of Financial Fanatics. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Deborah. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So we are not on the same part of the world as me. So you're currently in... in I'm in sunny St Kilda in Melbourne, in Melbourne, Melbourne. overlooking the the Port Phillip Bay. It's uh, it's quite beautiful. I'm very fortunate to be a home-based office uh, with such a lovely view. But yes, I'm in Melbourne. Similar weather to you, I understand. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know what's going on there, but yes, it's been, absolutely. It's one of my favourite places. I love Melbourne, Adelaide. I'm actually a real, a real fan of Adelaide. I most people don't like Adelaide, but that's one of my favourite places. So I've actually <laughs> met Scott through Business Blueprint, um, and we talked about the fact that I had a podcast. He said, oh, I'd love to come and talk to you. And we've just been catching up before this podcast, had a recording about what Scott's been up to. Now, he's been an accountant for many, many years, um, and he's really, really passionate about helping business owners and people know their numbers so they can make better business decisions. So, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? journey so you know how did you become an accountant what have you been up to in the time I can see you've got a profit first book in the background there in your in your video absolutely absolutely um well I wanted to be a photographer when I grew up and my old man said you know maybe the accounting thing should be the best uh way to 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 move forwards kind of one of those things that you know if you've got some sort of natural uh ability to do accounting then that's where you gravitate things become easier i've tried a lot of other things accounting's where i excel uh in my skill set so definitely that's how i became an accountant mm-hmm. um same as my brother and my sister-in-law and my father was an accountant amazing uh pedigree of accountants in our family um i'm the only exciting one though i must say well, my brother's <laughs> pretty exciting too <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, so the whole family of accountants, wow. Um, mm-hmm. And so you obviously liked it because you stuck to it as well. So <laughs> tell me what it is that you love about the work that you do. Yeah, I, I love being able to help. I mean, certainly I've, I've worked for large multinational businesses and I've worked for massive accounting firms and smaller accounting firms and my own accounting firm. And the thing that drives me the most is is the smaller, medium-sized business owner that puts everything on the line and so often doesn't get rewarded for that for that leap of faith that they take. You know, everyone thinks that start a business and or people listening here that know that's not the case, but you know, start a business and you'll be a millionaire in no time and you'll be able to have you know all the time off in the world and and boats and toys, but it just isn't the case and I think you know better accounting support better bookkeeping support knowing numbers is so vital to that journey to help those people get the desserts that they really need yeah fair enough and so I always like to ask my guests about the professional and personal best so you've obviously been on the planet for a few years tell me what are your sort of your best professionally and personally uh, well, if I can start with personally, I'm getting married in a month. So that's oh. really exciting to me. I think that was a, a, an exciting uh, thing that I've done. And I certainly would, I'm about to, you know, embark on a, or we're about to embark on not only a life journey, but a, a sailing journey up to the Sundays from Melbourne up to the Sundays uh, early next year. So we're really excited about getting the boat ready for that. So uh, there'll be lots of exciting things uh, coming um, up for me. Uh, but certainly my my personal best was meeting uh, Sandy, my fiance. From a, from a professional best, I think it was the the best thing that I've done is being able to jump from owning an accounting firm to having my own entrepreneurial business. So, which is a bookkeeping and accountant leasing business called Financial Fanatics. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's completely separate to being an accounting firm. It's, you're not a professional anymore. You're a business owner. And, and I, I love having been able to make that jump, you know, so that it pays me and it generates good profits, I think has been a, a fantastic thing for me to acknowledge that I've achieved. Yeah. And just talking earlier, you know, you've now got a team of 80 people. So it's a significant size business. Um, and that is very, very different to working as a technician, as an accountant in an accounting firm. So I'm guessing life has changed somewhat for you. It certainly has. It certainly has. And, and, and only because I'm not on the tools anymore, because I'm not a technician, which means I do have a lot more freedom in, you know, I'm, I'm, I seem to be working just as hard at times, but other times I've got the flexibility of doing other things, which is, which is great, <laughs> really good. So I understand that your business took quite a significant change in the last few years in terms of going from, yeah, being a, 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 a 
Australian based business into being a, a team that is now based overseas. So I lost my words there for a moment, but you know what I was trying to say. <laughs> Tell yes. me a little bit about that journey. Well, we I, I started um, Financial Fanatics in in parallel with my accounting firm, and then let that sort of bubble along until it got to a point where it could sustain me. And it was it was my passion project. So we we're out there helping other businesses um, and doing some wonderful things, and. I would dearly love to have made it full time. So I sold my accounting firm to free up my time because accountants mm -hmm. need to be there for their clients all the time. Um, and then I, that helped me expand that business. So that was back in 2000 and probably about 2018, I sold my accounting firm. Um, and then my, I had a, a, my marriage took a turn for the worse in uh, 2019. And I found myself at the start of 2020 uh, as a separated person living in a, an apartment by myself that was it was a new apartment but it was downstairs so it was all dark and dank um, and the world collapsing around me um, I'd spent <laughs> a lot of time in the Philippines building my business up and making sure that the people were fantastic uh, and that's how I ran the business by going over there um, making the major decisions I'd jump on a plane anytime and, uh, you know, have a chat to the guys, build that team, the operations, and then I'd come back and do the sales and marketing here in Australia. Um, but when when COVID closed around us, closed in around us, we were all of a sudden, you know, you can't just jump on a plane and fly over to the team. At the same time, there was lots happening with the team as well that needed those sort of decision-making abilities. And I just could not get into the country. I begged and pleaded for them to let me to come into the Philippines. It just didn't work. So... Uh, it was some pretty dark days, you know, around about April 2020 was, uh, was looked like everything was going to crumble and we wouldn't end up with anything. So, um, yeah, it was, that was a tough time. So, sure. so what happened to sort of turn that around? Because it wasn't such a long time ago. It's only, you know, it wasn't. Years. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like a long time. It feels like a lifetime ago. Um <laughs> Uh, I met I met a guy uh, who said that he was a uh, he, he ran he ran a car wash business, um, which which sounded odd, but um, uh, he also said he was an EOS implementer, and I I never heard of EOS before. I asked him what that was. Uh, he explained it. Um, I think he he sent me rocket fuel or traction, one of the two, um, as a as a gift, and loved that. Read it. And I thought, ah, this is something that that I can use right now to implement if I can implement it remotely. Um, and uh, it, it could be the answer to my management, my my problem of not being able to jump on that plane and manage that business so that and, and empower the team. So that's what we did. So that's how I got introduced to he EOS. Was... And the EOS was the thing that enabled me to effectively empower my a great bunch of managers that I have over in the Philippines to to do what they needed to do a lot more effectively than, you know, having to rely on me to answer the calls. Uh, which is which is awesome as an EOS implementer. That makes my heart sing. But I'm, I'm kind of keen to know, what was it about EOS that gave you that ability? Um, the meeting structure, so, sort of the understanding and defining roles a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, we would call that, I guess, an accountability chart. Um, the meeting tempo, so breaking it down into rather than just having ad hoc meetings all the time, uh, but being able to have just one. I would never believe that we could just do everything that we needed to do as a leadership team in 90 minutes max, uh, you know, once a week. So that setting that meeting tempo, having the quarterly goals, uh, understanding a little bit more about our business, by you know creating the the vision traction organizer and and understanding you know who our target markets were and all that sort of stuff yeah. uh, was a great discipline even though you know I've been an accountant I understand planning business planning uh, to a large degree this th this sort of just simplified it all down and and helped the team understand exactly what we were trying to achieve as well which is mm -hmm. more than I could do uh, talking in their ear all the time. <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, um, I fell in love with the EOS because of its simplicity. So I'd originally done some scaling up training and, and done some work around that and worked with the ISRs. And I suddenly came across EOS and went, oh my goodness, this actually takes all of this amazing stuff that was a little bit too complicated and brings it into a nice, simple framework that us as entrepreneurs can actually work with. It doesn't feel too constrictive, but at the same time, it brings us a little bit of structure that we actually need. And those level 10 meetings, um, people, everybody says, you can't do all of our meetings in one meeting 
meeting or you can't get all of the business stuff done in 90 minutes a week. And yet when you start to do it, it actually becomes quite easy, doesn't it? It does. And you know what? Our team gets really excited. We had a 40 minute meeting uh, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, great. <laughs> There's no other, nothing else there. It to to, doesn't need to go the full time. And yeah, it's mm. unbelievable that, that you can. I think it's about, for me, it's about the empowerment of those individuals to, to be able to you know, run the business or their part of the business, what they're accountable for, you know, them understanding it, uh, that that's the pure magic of the system. So, Because they they get to see how it fits in with the greater vision of the organisation, how that fits in with the goals for the year. And I think it also brings a real laser sharp focus. I mean, I know that um, I had one client who came to me, had 43 things they wanted to get done in a year. And it's like, okay, even the best team in the world is not going to achieve 43 different things. Why don't we narrow that down? And we got it down to about seven. um, And in that one year that they've been sort of working with it, they've made such huge inroads because they were trying to do too much. Absolutely. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where we were on our and our initial meetings with EOS. It was definitely a case of <laughs> these are all the things that we need to do and we all need important. to do them. Because you know, yeah. I am the visionary, uh, the founder of the business. You know, obviously I set very high expectations and, yes. and standards for people. Um, but, you know, you know, actually bringing it down to things that people can actually achieve uh, is a great way to move an organisation forward. So it's yeah. fantastic. Now, you mentioned you're the visionary, and this is probably a term maybe most people may have heard of, but don't really understand what it means. So can you tell me in your sort of words what you see the role as the visionary and where you do <laughs> get involved and where you don't get involved? Sure. I've got to be as hands-off as possible, um, <laughs> but, 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 but I want to be hands-on on everything. So mm. um, the visionary, I guess, is someone who deals with big relationships, so relationships with it you know for us it's our landlord for our building that we rent in in the philippines um it's our largest clients that that might need some special hand holding or, or problem solving or or just general advice mm-hmm. um it would be um you know i'm responsible for creating the vision or for, for having the big ideas so I, I like to say i'm an ideas man i come up with plenty of ideas most of them would be no good but um <laughs> Some of them might just change the world. So um, it's, it's, but that's my job to come up with those ideas and to be as hands off as possible, I think, which is the really hard thing for us visionaries to do to, because if we've got our fingers in every single pie, it just ends up a mashy pie. Yeah, completely. And so when you kind of discovered this visionary box and were told that you could work on the big ideas, the crazy ideas, the big relationships, uh, was that a bit of a relief for you in terms of knowing where you could add some value? Or just tell me, you know, when you came across this concept, what did it mean for you? Oh, wow. What an, it's an exciting um, prospect of, of being able to you know, just sort of, because it frees up your time, first of all. So mm-hmm. you think, well, if I, all I do is you know, I can do a general oversight of the business and make sure it's tracking in the right direction without interfering too much. But just coming up with it, having space to come up with the ideas uh, is fantastic. Also, the freedom that that gives you, because it's not necessarily a full-time job. So then it might be, oh, I can create other businesses or have other ideas that might not fit with this one. And, um, you know, I my life plan would see me having four or five different businesses that I could be visionary of and that's certainly, I think, a, a, an achievable thing to do if you're not trying to do every single role in every single of those one of those businesses. And it sounds to me like you've actually managed to get to the point where you are able to let go, where you're letting your integrator and your team actually kind of get on with it. That doesn't happen overnight, does it? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> What's the what's the what's the journey you've gone through? Because I mean, first of all, you have to find the right person to be an integrator. So tell me a little bit about your journey in terms of you know handing over the reins. We call it letting go. How did you let go? Okay, okay, yeah. Um, so I found a person in the Philippines who was a friend of mine, um, and she has a business that was very similar to mine in, in terms of you know she leased out people. She doesn't do the bookkeeping, but she you know was doing VAs. Um, and I thought she would be a good fit because she understands at least how we work. Um, and so she came along and, and went through the EOS process. Um, I didn't like it at all because it was, you know, all of a sudden it was giving other people a voice into our values, which is something that I had set. These are, this is my business, my values, uh, mine. And then it was, 
you know, giving other people on the leadership team voice into our vision and, and you know, what we want to achieve. And I'm like, no, but that's all me. I This is what I need to do. I don't need you guys to have a voice. I need you guys to facilitate my ideas. Um, but I went along with the process very skeptically. Um, and the output that we got after just two short days or two long days, <laughs> one month apart, but um, was uh, outstanding. You know, the, the values exercise itself, you know, I could not fault the logic behind where we morphed our values and our vision and, and you know, what we were standing for. Uh, and then, I, then it was easier to let go because I could see that it was so much better than anything that I could create by myself. And I think there's that sense of ownership too. And I, I've done this a number of times now with clients where we go through the sort of the, the core values and the um, core focus exercise and the, the founders are nervous that, yes, it's my business. I've got these values. And we ask the teams individually to come up with what they think the core values are based on the people you've got working in the business. And often they're all very, very similar. Like there's not huge differences around what the, the core values should be, but it's having that input and having them give their, their way of articulating it. Sometimes they do it better than we can I think and so we've got this massive idea about what we want but they go they nail it in terms of the, the day-to-day practicalities and so they feel like they've got some ownership but also we end up with a better result right oh absolutely and, yeah. and at the end of the day you've got to realize you know you've got to think is this a small business that I want to keep 100% control of or is this something that I want to free up and and unleash on the world in la you know and, and help add value on a much broader scale than you ever could by yourself so yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So do you have a favorite tool in the EOS toolbox? Um, not, not really. I, I love there's some there's some tools in the toolbox that I that I desperately want to get uh, you know, the, the same page meetings. Yep. Um, I have a shareholder in the business that that it's I find difficult to um not not to get on the same page, but just to bring them up to speed with where we're at and what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, love that, love that, that sort of tool, I think would be. A- yeah. And you've talked about the level 10 meetings, of course, and they're probably one of the most popular tools in terms of uh, all the tools that we teach. That's the one that I think makes the biggest difference. Oh, absolutely. Level, the level 10s, the, the, those meeting tempos of the quarterly reviews, um, and any annual reviews as well has been fantastic. We, we had our annual review, um, last time I visited the Philippines, um, a couple of months ago, we're in June, and it was a g- really well structured, great output that we got from that meeting. It was fantastic, really, really, and everyone yeah. stepped up another level. It was just great. And it's again, it's really funny because you know I share that that tool for the annual performance reviews, and it's you know it's a one page or two page document depending on which one you're using, and so it looks pretty simple. People go, it can't possibly be, you know, can't possibly work. I remember when I was at Tower and I was managing quite a large team at Tower, like we had a 14 page performance development and review process we went through every quarter, every uh, once yep. a year as well, and it was just overwhelming. And I don't think it got any better result. I know it didn't um, than actually just using a one page or we do the people analyzer, we check in with the core values, do they GWs see their role and then we ask what's working what's not working and you know it becomes as simple as that and I love the people analyzer in terms of it it constantly reinforcing the values of the business and and what we stand for and who we are and and you know if it's constant if you're evaluating people about it they're 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 performing their role based on the values then you can as a as an owner as a visionary you can trust that people are going to do things that you would, the way you would want them to do it. And I yeah. think that's the beautiful part of that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, your business has has grown consistently, but there must have been some ups and downs in that in that business growth. So to go from being, you know, uh, a small accounting firm to be a team of 80, there has to be some, some challenges along the way. What have those challenges been for you? Oh, there's been lots of challenges. Um, we've had, you know, when we went to Cebu, which is where we're we're based because we didn't want to go to Manila. I I I'm not a big fan of Manila. If you Manila's the a very busy um, city, very smoke smoggy, very hard to get around. It can take you two hours to get you know five kilometers in um, in peak hour in in Manila. Yep. So it's best to avoid it. Um, I was going to sort of not you know think about somewhere else other than the Philippines, but someone suggested I check out Cebu, which is the second biggest city. Uh, in the Philippines has some of those traffic problems, but nowhere near as much. The people are great. 
there was there just wasn't any accountant specialist or bookkeeping firm specialists in uh, in Cebu. So we were kind of like first to market in that, which was great. And then the biggest player in the market came and uh, plumped themselves right near us, and then started to poach all of our stuff, um, which was. <laughs> Uh, and, and pay them a lot more, which is great for them. Um, not great for our Australian clients who then would have, you know, all of them, the market just goes up and up and up when you, mm -hmm. when you tell people that's what they're worth. So um, it, that sort of started a bit of bidding war. So we lost, you know, in one year, I think we had 20 of our team members go over to them. Um, that was, that's been really tough. We've had to replace them, train them, you know, get, get our, our people up and really identify, well, you know, they're a, a massive organization where we're quite boutique, you know, where do, where's our sweet spot when it comes to serving uh, clients. And it's definitely around the bookkeeping side of things, making that direct to, to a small, medium sized business. And that's where I'm really passionate about that side of our business. Yeah. Um, or the smaller accountants and smaller business bookkeepers that don't want to go to the big guys. They don't want to be treated like a number. A number. They want to be treated, you know, with a lot more personal. So that, that's, that was really tough. That you know, the entry of the competitor. And of course, COVID um, last Christmas, as things were starting to open up, there was a typhoon that hit Cebu um, yeah. that put, uh, you know, took out the water supply for about a week um, and took out power and internet Fortunately, we have backup supplies of internet and um, there was the diesel generator in the building. So um, our power, we were able to maintain our service to our clients where a lot of other businesses couldn't. So that was that was exciting. It was a one in 10 year event. So hopefully we've got another nine years before that happens again. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. But yeah, that, sort of certainly working in a third world country has a lot of challenges about, you know, the logistics and making sure that people can get to an office. Because we work in you know, the financial services business, the privacy principles are so paramount to what we do, which means we really can't, except in exceptional circumstances like COVID early days in the Philippines, um, we don't let people work from home because we just can't control the information that they see and how they use that that information. So Okay. So you've actually got yeah, physical of offices where your staff come into them and you... That's right. They're, they're pretty much like a remote office, just as it would be in Australia, but they're based in the Philippines. And exactly. you're responsible for training, managing, leading, all that, um, all done remotely? Or do you have a... Um, in your organisational chart, do you have a... Um, a head of operations, for example, operations person that looks after that particular thing. Yes, we do. So we have we actually split the head of operations role into our into two, and we have yep. now head of bookkeeping and head of uh, leased accountants, and then we have um, HR head of HR um, that that takes care of it, and a head of finance over there as well. It does. You can imagine the payroll is quite complex. Um, to make sure that everyone gets paid right and paid on time, all that sort of stuff, and also yeah. manages their Philippine bank accounts. Um, so yeah, yeah, that all that the whole um, engine room of the business uh, is taken care of by that Filipino team. Um, I don't need to get involved in that at all. Sure. Okay. So on that, but the sales and the marketing is actually done from the Australian side of the business. Yes. Yes. So I I do that side of stuff. Just, yep. it's something that i'm interested in passion and as i love talking to people i love love that that kind of interaction um for how we can help and and do that side yeah. so yeah and that's the thing i mean with the accountability chart you can actually wear a couple of hats in a business you know if you're a visionary but you also love the sales and marketing side then you can actually still wear that accountability thing um and of course it isn't about titles i use the term heads of but i mean more the the person is responsible for that function um that functional area because it isn't about titles it's about what they're actually accountable for doing so You've obviously got this. People know exactly what their five roles are. Um, and then in that leadership team meeting with them being remote, how do you you do it by Zoom, Google Hangout, something like that? Uh, yeah, we Zoom, Zoom away. Yep. Works well? Works very well. Works yeah. very well. Um, okay, you know, can't, you know, share your screen and then the, the um, scoreboard and everything yep. else just gets done and put up there. It's, it's It makes it an easy way to, to do a meeting. I'd, um I don't, next week I'll be in the Philippines um, yeah. and we'll do a live meeting and then we'll do our quarterly review the week after. Um, so yeah, sometimes the first time I did a, a, um, a live meeting when I was back in the Philippines after COVID, um, 
all of a sudden people started jumping on Zoom. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> let's all just go to the boardroom. Let's not, <laughs> let's not do the Zoom thing anymore. And so, you know, we can meet in person now. But it yeah. was kind of a bit of a style, style you know, meeting because uh, we were just so used to doing, doing it, online. it all on Zoom. And do you use any software to manage your EOS meetings and things? Or have you got your own um, scorecards no, no, and don't. meeting templates? We don't. We just have our own um templates that we've done for the scoreboard and um yeah. we use the standard eos agenda and um yeah, yeah just... and again that's one of the things i love is like there's some great software out there that actually helps you with doing that we've got eos one and a couple of others that can do it but at the same time anybody can run it if you've got excel and a word document you can actually run eos right yeah exactly yeah. exactly cool. okay so um just in terms of I love for the listeners to take something away from this that they can actually implement in their business. So I'm really yep. pleased to hear that EOS is working for you and great so that you know, you've been able to get through all of the, the challenges that have been in the last couple of years. What would be your three top tips for anybody in business right now who's either looking to grow or feeling like they're stuck, they hit the ceiling? What would you say your three top tips for them? Um, well, well, tip number one is to value your time. Um, yeah. So there's, you know, there's, there's a gift that you're there to give to the world um it probably doesn't i mean if you're a bookkeeper that's great but if you're not then you've got to value your time more and maybe stop doing the bookkeeping get get help yeah. when it comes to the bookkeeping side of things though you know i'm everyone is you know feels for those entrepreneurs that are out there at 10 o'clock at night doing bookkeeping work um but you don't have to do that and and it's often better to not do that because you're you've got the elevated helicopter view of your business rather than being in the weeds so, so I, the first thing would be stop doing the bookkeeping and value your time second one would be know your numbers so like a lot of business owners are out there not really knowing how their business is performing um they sort of get a feeling they've got they've got some sort of gut feel or they've got some sort of well i know if my machine is operating x number of hours i must be making money or if i've got x amount of dollars in the bank account then i must be doing okay um, but I really encourage business owners to know your numbers, know what you're trying to achieve and absolutely ha have an idea anyway about what your business is doing because numbers are just, uh, they're, they're the equal representation of all the stories of your business. So it sort of takes all these stories and puts them into something that's very objective rather than subjective. So mm -hmm. know your numbers. Yep. Um, and the final one is trust your team, empower your team. Yeah. Um, people want to, in general, people want to do their best, uh, yes. and they can only do their best if you trust them to, and you give them a, a structure that enables them to really do their best. Um, yeah. so that, that's, that's the other thing I would have em, empower people and they will not let you down. No, I think that's a really valid point. I think we're often very scared of letting go because we kind of go, but, you know, um, how do we know that they've got the best interests at heart? But if you've got the right structure in place and they know what they're accountable for and there's some clear boundaries and some scorecards they have to achieve, we don't have to micromanage them. It's like, actually, that's your accountability. You know what you need to do. Go ahead and do it. Only if you're not doing it, then it's my role as a leader to step in and go, how can I help you to do that? Um, and only then, if, if that's not working, there's other conversations to be had. But I think you're right. Most people genuinely actually love having boundaries love having things that they're aiming for and love to actually take responsibility for things absolutely yeah oh brilliant okay so cool this is really interesting because obviously we haven't talked about this before so this has been really helpful to, to hear your side of it um if people were thinking about using eos and maybe sitting on the fence and going oh i'm not quite sure you know i'm not sure if i like the structure what would you say to them i'd say if if your business is of a a, a you know, if you've got enough people around you, I think for, for one man bands, it, it can be, a, a you know, if you're wearing every single hat, then you're, yeah. you know, you're not really getting the benefits of the system. But if you've got enough good people around you um, and you want to take that next level in your business, then I would 100% encourage them. I would, I've never looked back. I've never thought of using anything other than EOS. I think it's just fantastic. I know if you get too big at, at certain points, um it can get a bit clunky you know when you're really large but yep. you know let's hope we all get to that size <laughs> Thank you. It's interesting. I mean, over in the US, we, we generally say between 10 and 250 staff is like the perfect size because that's when it works really, really well. But we've got some clients over in the US who've got four or 500 staff and are still doing it. And it just comes down to not overcomplicating it, keeping it as simple as you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. 
Cool. Hey, look, I've really enjoyed hearing your stories. Thank you so much. Um, if people want to get in contact with you for a couple of reasons, they might want to find out about the bookkeeping services that you offer or ask you a few questions about EOS, how would they get hold of you, Scott? Um, probably the best thing to do is go to our website, which is www.financialfanatics.com. Yep. Um, and there, there's a, a bunch of different things that you can click on. Uh, I've got an ebook called Unfunk Your Business Finances. If you if you need to know how to read balance sheets or profit and losses, then then that's um, that's there for you to have. Um, and if if listeners of this show would like me to send them a hard copy of that book, I'd only be too delighted if you can. You know, if you if you did want to subscribe to that uh, ebook, just send yep. me a little. You'll get the links to my emails and and just send me a little message and I'll send you a hard copy of that book. Uh, so it's called Unfunk. Free. Unfunk your business finances. Your business finances. Excellent. Okay. Might be quite a question copy myself. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so my, all my contact details are there. I yeah. don't hide. I'm very, 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 very easy to find. Well, that's fantastic. Hey, look, I really appreciate your time and your sharing your expertise and your, your journey with you. Um, congratulations on your marriage as a person Thank who you. just recently got married a few years ago myself. I, I know that it's, it's great to find that person that makes you happy again um, and Absolutely. have an awesome time in the Sundays. I mean, I can't Thank believe you. that you're going off and, so how long are you going for? Um, well, at the moment, it's planned for three months, but we'll see. Uh, yeah. You know, we'll, we'll see how the business is doing and and how how often I have to get off the boat and, and deal with things. But um, yeah. if it goes well, we might just keep going around and doing a lap. So, we'll, <laughs> so just to be really Australia. clear, you're going to be recently married and living in a tiny little boat, yeah? <laughs> Nothing like marriage for that yeah <laughs> excellent <laughs> actually having just got back from a, a two-week um trip around the south island in a motorhome with my husband which was you know very pretty tiny it was actually one of the best trips i've ever and, done it was a lot of yeah, fun yeah absolutely but a boat is even more exciting being out on the water oh, seeing various bits and I pieces think equally as anyway <laughs> yeah Cool. Well, hey, look, thank you so, so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Lovely to talk to you. If you want to get in contact with Scott, as he said, you can go to www.financialfanatics.com. Um, ask him for a copy of, of his book, Unfunk Your Business Finances. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask him questions about bookkeeping, overseas teams or EOS, anything that takes your fancy. Scott, Please. appreciate your time. Thank you very, very much. Look forward to seeing you again soon. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thanks.